to practice your righteousness in front of others to be seen by them. If you do, you will have no reward from your Father in heaven. So when you give to the needy, do not announce it with trumpets, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and on the streets, to be honoured by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving may be in secret. Then your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will re reward you. And when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by others. Truly I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father, who is unseen. Then your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. And when you pray, do not keep on babbling like pagans, for they think they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask him. And I think we've all experienced that at times, haven't we, that sometimes we pray, and then the answer comes almost immediately. You think, wow, God knew what I wanted before I even prayed, and sometimes we're desperate, and the answer comes. And sometimes, when we don't pray, the answer comes. And you think, yeah, I should have prayed about that. Chronicles 16 and verses 8 to 13, it just sets our mood for how we can come in prayer. Give praise to the Lord, proclaim his name. Make known among the nations what he has done. Sing to him, sing praise to him. Tell of all his wonderful acts. Glory in his holy name. Let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Look to the Lord and his strength. Seek his face always. Remember the wonders he has done, his miracles and the judgments he pronounced. You, his servants, the descendants of Israel, his chosen ones, the children of Jacob. He is the Lord our God. His judgments are in all the earth. So praise the Lord for that. Let us remember and give praise to God for all he's done. And when we get a bit down and feel that perhaps God's not around anymore, well he is, and if we remember what he's done in the past in our lives, we've got that reassurance that we can come to him and pray. The situation may not disappear straight away, but we know that God hears and God is all powerful. If I was asked to somebody to read 1 Chronicles and from chapter 1 to chapter 9, apart from the length of it, I think most people would balk when they realise it was a list of names that goes on and on and on, a whole genealogy. But in chapter 4, and verses 9 and 10, a window opens and there's a break in that gap of names. And it centres on one person that we'd never heard of before, and we don't hear of again in the scripture. Chronicles chapter 4, and verses 9 to 10. Jabez was more honourable than his brothers. His mother had named him Jabez, saying, I gave birth to him in pain. Jabez cried out to the God of Israel, Oh, that you would bless me! and enlarge my territory. Let your hand be with me, and keep me from harm, so that I will be free from pain. And God granted his request. If I was to say to a Jew about Jabez, and he looked at the Hebrew and said it in Hebrew, he'd be saying something like, your bets. And our English transliteration sort of brings it down to Jabez or Jabez, however you want to pronounce it. Um, but we've got all this family genealogies right through the chapters of the first nine chapters and a few more besides in 1 Chronicles. And this man pops up right in the middle of it. And he sort of stops us in our tracks. 
And seemingly, if you just look at the Bible, there doesn't seem to be any clear connection where Jabez fits into this. Maybe he was the son of one of those that are mentioned. Maybe the son of Cos, as one commentator put it. But I'm not told in the scripture, and I haven't got the time or the resource to just look into all the Jewish history and find out all these things that more learned people do. But if you look back in chapter 2 and verse 55, you'll find there's a place called Jabez as well. And one of the commentators I looked at said that Jabez was in fact socially well established. Um, he's something to do with the law and he's well known, well respected in that area. And the town or area was named after him. I don't know if that's true, but that's what this commentator said about the Jewish history. And the books of Chronicles refer to a time when the remnant of Israel had returned from Babylonian captivity. They'd had a hard time there. And although originally it was one book, it was written to encourage God's people to progress forward from a time of suffering, a time of judgment, in exile, to a time of rebuilding the nation materially, and more importantly, spiritually. And there was this reassurance that God's purposes never fail, and that is true for you and for me today, just as it was for all the Old Testament people, all the people through the New Testament. God's purposes will never fail. So the prayer of Jabez isn't just for individual Christians and families, it is for today. It's for fellowships and churches, denominations, even whole nations, as this prayer was written in 1 Chronicles. Who was Jabez? Well, as I've said, we don't really know. He just pops up and disappears. Was he a real person even? Probably. Probably linked somehow to this genealogy, fits in somewhere. But why would he have special mention? Why? Why would he stand out from all the other people in this genealogy? There's hundreds of them. Some of them I can't even pronounce. But there's hundreds of them. <coughs> and yet Jabez has been picked to bring a word from God to each one of us. Certainly the prayer was relevant to the Israelite situation when they returned from exile. And could it be that God is using Jabez as an example from which we too can find guidance and encouragement for our lives and our problems, for our churches and even this nation? I read earlier in 1 Chronicles 16 words which echo words found in the Psalms. And we do need to recall what God has already done and how at times is overridden things that have been going on that shouldn't have been. How he's brought the church from the very beginnings, right through the ages, through some great times of difficulty and problems. And I heard last night in the concert where one description was read about the church in the Middle Ages and a bit later on, how it virtually had fallen completely away. The, um, the um, what shall we say, the administration and the spiritual guidance of the church had become so self-centred and self-interested that the people didn't matter anymore. And all sorts of factions grew up and I read in church history some time ago where of one chapel there was so great a division that in the end the elders were locked out of their own building and um, it's up somewhere up north, but um, a terrible situation. But God is still bringing his purposes together. And through all this turmoil and conflict, we're here now. We're worshipping together. We're enjoying so far worship that is free and unrestrained. And long may that continue. But God's purpose is that his church will never fail. His church will never be destroyed. It doesn't matter if it's underground, it will go on. 
And Jabez here is bringing a prayer to God. It's not only relevant to the Israelite nation at that time, but it's relevant to us as we call everything that God's done. If we were to look at 2 Chronicles 7 and verse 14, we can read that wonderful promise and exhortation. If my people, who are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and heal their land. And with this background, we can look at the prayer of Jabez, perhaps afresh. There's some key points. The name for start means pain. His mother must have had a terribly painful birth. Maybe Jabez suffered a lot of pain himself through his life. We don't know. But Israel had suffered so much pain and persecution through their disobedience and through their exiles and through the troubles they'd been through. Jabez was referred to as more honourable than his brothers. He stood apart from them, maybe spiritually. He was an indication to Israel as a nation of God's requirements for prayer to be granted. Let us be more honourable than people outside who don't know the Lord. There's some good people out there. I don't did cry any of them. I think in every person, even the vilest prisoner, locked up for life, somewhere deep in their heart, there is some good. If only it could be ignited and brought out. But for people outside, people in this road even, there's a whole new future for them if they can only come to know our Lord. There's four main points on the positive ideals that God had for Israel as they move from defeat and exile in renewal and progress. Do we need renewal and progress? I guess we do not only as a fellowship, but as individuals. We're learning all the time, we're growing all the time. And even as our bodies start shrinking a bit and start complaining a bit to the rest of our bodies, we're still growing spiritually. When I talk to Pamela, although she may be declining physically and mentally, spiritually she's not declining. And if we can, if I can sing a song or bring some music to her, she's there and she's talking about Jesus. She may not remember him when she's on her own, but when that's stimulated, it comes alive. Praise God for that. So do we need renewal? Do we need more progress? Well, as the years go by and the time gets shorter for each of us, I'm sorry, I'm getting a bit gloomy. As the time gets shorter, it seems to become more urgent that we do things and we grow and get things sorted out. Four points. The first, oh, that thou would bless me. Who can be blessed? Individuals, groups, leaders, governments, nations can be blessed. Israel experienced times of blessing and times of hardship and judgment, depending on how they live their lives in accordance to God or not. But what is blessing? The path to blessing is humble obedience to God's will to begin with. It's a specific gift from God. It's for a specific time and a specific purpose. We often think, yes, you know, God bless me. And we're looking for comfort and freedom from pain and sorrow and everything else. But the blessing God gives is far greater than that. It's God's nature to want to increase our lives, our spiritual lives, increase our standing with him, bring us closer to him. It's his nature to bless his people as they follow his way, the way to blessing. Israel, when they're in Egypt, moved out. And they trekked through the desert for years and years and years in various states of obedience and disobedience. They're heading for Canaan, 
the promised land. We're heading for our Canaan, the promised land. And we've got a little bit of Canaan here on earth if we just progress onwards. But one day there'll be that promised land for each of us. The writer in Genesis 12 and verse 2 writes, I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great and you shall be a blessing. There's a clue there that as we are blessed, that blessing flows out to others. As we enjoy the love of God, and certainly in our church, we try to shed that love of God outside the walls. And I know you do here, you have your coffee mornings and various other things that you do. The blessing is not to be kept in, but be spread around. And then people will see God in our lives. They will see God that can bless them and help them. So it's from God to us, and it's to others through us. When Jacob was wrestling with that man, as he was wrestling with God, and he said, let me go, for the, day is, for the day breaks. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. How persistent are we asking for blessing? How persistent are we to ask for God's guidance and help? And if need be, correction. And I have to say that God's corrected me a few times, and sometimes it hasn't been very nice. But when I look back, I think, yeah, I shouldn't have been in that place, <clears throat> that I wouldn't have had this, and then God wouldn't have had to teach me to do the right thing rather than the wrong thing. We have to be persistent in prayer, to hold on to his word, hold on to his promises. We know that God is constant and faithful. And his promises come to us through the cross, through Jesus as King of Kings and Lord of our lives. Paul writing to the Ephesians in Ephesians 1 and verse 3 says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in with every spiritual blessing, where? In heavenly places in Christ. They're heavenly blessings. We don't need to pray to win the lottery or anything like that. That's temporal blessings, physical blessings. And how many millionaires, including Boris Becker, have found themselves bankrupt and facing prison? And yet they were multi-millionaires. It doesn't matter. People in Africa I've been in touch with in the past, they're greatly blessed. They're on fire for God, yet they've got nothing. They've got nothing. When the rains come, it washes their buildings away and breaks down their churches. They just rebuild and carry on with the blessing. Blessing is a spiritual prosperity. And Jabez prayed for God's best in his life. Bless me indeed. Bless me a lot. <coughs> Don't we ask God to bless us a lot? Or do we hold back and say, well, you know, it's only little me, you know. You know, just bless me a tiny bit, Lord. But Jabez prayed. Oh, that thou would bless me and enlarge my territory. I wonder what our limitations are to blessing. Is there something that I might need to remove a limitation in my life from to, to enjoy God's blessing further? Jabez here is saying, enlarge my territory. He didn't mean give him a great, you know, swath of land. He didn't mean he wants the whole country to himself. What he meant was, he wants no restrictions of the blessings. As Israel returned from captivity, they came into an impoverished and, impoverished and possibly semi-desolate land. There was a lot of rebuilding to do, both 
both in terms of land and buildings and spiritually also. But that prayer, enlarge my territory. Israel wanted to have the whole promised land. They wanted to enjoy the blessings of being a nation again, untroubled by wars. As we pray for our territory to be <coughs> enlarged, our sphere of influence, if you like, how can we better speak to others? Sometimes I find it difficult. I'm not an extrovert. Some people find it a lot easier. But how can we let the blessing of God enlarge that territory of blessing to others? How can our territory, our closeness to God, our knowledge of Him, everything else pertaining to our Christian lives, expand and expand? I think we all know this illustration of Perhaps somebody in a care home, some elderly person sat in an armchair, relying on carers to come in to do everything for them. And they were Christians, they say, there's nothing more I can do. And yet my answer is always, yes, there is the most important ministry of all, prayer. You can pray. The Hebrew word for territory means border, space, coast, bounds, limits. What is our territory? Are we limiting ourselves? Are we limiting our own thoughts? I'm a great self-critic. If things aren't right, if I listen to myself singing, I thought, no, there's no way, so I don't listen to myself singing anymore. I won't listen to myself preaching. It may not be any good anyway, but um, I don't like to hear myself because I'm all the time judging. Stop judging ourselves. Let's get blessed. Let's move on. The tribes, when Joshua was, shall we say, allocating the various territories in the land to them, in Joshua 17 and verse 14, mm -hmm. then the children of jo Joseph spoke to Joshua, saying, why have you given us only one lot and one share to inherit? Since we are a great people, inasmuch as the Lord has blessed us until now. So Joshua answered them, If you are a great people, then go up to the forest country and clear a place for yourself there in the land of the Perizzites and the giants, since the mountains of Ephraim are too confined for you. Are we too confined? Are we too comfortable? Are we limited by what we already know, what we already experience? Or have we got a comfort zone to move out of? And Joshua spoke to the house of Joseph, to Ephraim and Manasseh, saying, You are a great people and have great power. You shall not have only one lot, but the mountain country shall be yours. Although it is wooded, you shall cut it down. And its farthest extent shall be yours, for you shall drive out the Canaanites, though they have iron chariots and are strong. <coughs> drive out. Can we drive out something from our lives that's hindering our spiritual prayers? Can we pray, Lord, get me out of my comfort zone, so that I can enter into a greater measure of your blessing? Because sometimes blessing doesn't look like a blessing to begin with. It looks like hard work. But as we move out of our comfort zone, we find that indeed it is a great blessing. And then Jabez prayed, Let your hand be with me. When the hand of God really is upon you, it's apparent to everyone around. God, in all his glory, in all his majesty, in all his splendour and awesomeness, he wants to put his hand on you and on me, on us, this fellowship. The Hebrew word for hand here is one meaning of an open hand. God's not going, I've got you, you're doing this. And if you don't like it, 
I'm going to punish you. No, that's not God. That's not my God. <coughs> He's got his hand open for you. And he'll lift you up. As he blesses you and your territory is enlarged, you'll be lifted up in his power. <coughs> what a comfort to know that we've got a God with an open hand to take ours, lift us up through our troubles and our problems and our weaknesses and encourage us. The power of God's hand, it can't be underestimated. That power perhaps could be demonstrated by the resurrection power of Jesus Christ. If Jesus can rise again, we not right, might not rise again physically, but we'll rise again spiritually. And we can rise today in the strength of his hand as he lifts us up. In Luke 24 and verse 49, Luke writes, Behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you are endured with power from on high. And in 2 Timothy 1 and verse 7, we can read, For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and love, <coughs> of power and love, and of a sound mind. God's supply is available to us. Not sometimes, all the time. That lovely psalm, Psalm 23, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. It doesn't mean to say we're going to get all the luxuries, but we will not want from the presence of God. He will be there with us. Let your hand be with me. It's like a spiritual sat-nav, his hand. I told my daughter yesterday and she was wanted to get home from the care home where we were visiting. And I said, well, you turn the left here and you do it. She said, oh, don't worry, I'll put my sat-nav on. I'll just do what it tells me. Could be dangerous, but the eternal sat-nav will guide you perfectly. And when you get out of your comfort zone, you'll find the eternal sat nav is taking you step by step. I'm moving on because time is against us. And the last part of his prayer is, keep me from harm so that I will be free from pain. Keep me from harm so that I will be free from pain. I wonder what harm is. I often pray as I live on my own now for protection, mainly against myself that um, I don't try and do things that I shouldn't be trying to do, like going up ladders and things like that. Um, I only go about four steps now, but that's my limit. I don't just pray for that. I pray that I shall be kept free from sin. Sin is the greatest harm there is. Temptation is the beginning of sin. You either look at it and think, oh, we've got to fight this, or you look away, or walk away. And if you look at it and fight it, you've got a big struggle on your hands. You might win, but you might not. Because in our own strength, we're weak. But in his strength, we are strong. We're in his hand. That's the old hymn, isn't there? I'm in his hands, I'm in his hands. No matter what the future holds, I'm in his hands. We're in his hands. We can have protection from sin. Lord's Prayer. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. God won't lead us into temptation, but he will deliver us out of it. Keep me from harm, so I will be free from pain. And the wages of sin may not be death, physical death, they will be pain. There will be deprivation, there will be loss. 
There'll be loss in our spiritual life, a loss of our walk with God. And here, for the nation of Israel, the prayer is to keep them from harm. They'll be free from further pain and exile, judgments and problems. The Romans, when Paul writes to them, he writes of his knowledge of them in 16 and verse 19, For your obedience has become known to all. Therefore I am glad on your behalf, for I want you to be wise in what is good and simple concerning evil. Simple concerning evil. So don't let struggle with sin and say, I'll deal with this, then I'm okay, I'll be able to go to God. There's a cross, there's a blood that was shed. And if we're struggling with sin, we're struggling with problems, go to God first, let his hand help you <coughs> fight it. <coughs> He's got all the power. He hears all our prayers. He will empower you and he will empower me as he continues to hold you in the palm of his hand and lift you up in his power and strength. So what do we say to all this? My time is gone. Jabez's name stood out amongst the hundreds in these genealogies. He wasn't a great prophet. He wasn't a great preacher. He wasn't a wise <laughs> ruler but he was a highly respected member of his society. People knew that he was a good guy, to use modern phraseology. He was remembered in scripture because of his prayer. And I know the Holy Spirit inspires scripture and it's put there for our instruction and our guidance. It was a prayer, not only for Jabez, but I believe it was a prayer for that nation. And as we look on this prayer, and as we pray along the lines of that prayer, it will not only enlarge our lives, it can enlarge the lives of those around us, and maybe the whole land. I don't know whether there's a revival coming, the scripture doesn't tell me that, it tells me there's going to be lots and lots of problems and we see them coming. But that doesn't stop us enlarging our territory through the prayer of Jabez. It was a prayer that was fully aligned to God's will, not only for him, but for the nation of Israel. It was a personal prayer, but also a national prayer, a communal prayer, if you like. So let's consider our prayers, so that they're aligned to God's revealed will. Asking in the name of Jesus means that we ask prayers that Jesus is willing to bring to the throne of God, interceding for us. I don't think we'd ask Jesus for us to win the lottery, would we? But we can ask Jesus to expand our Christian lives. And he will bring that to the Father in heaven. <coughs> Let's consider the motives of our prayers. And motivation is a very subtle thing, isn't it? Sometimes we're not aware of the true motives as we pray. Because self is always there to preserve self. In James chapter 4 we could read, We have not because we ask not. And sometimes we don't ask with right motivation either. So let's pray for God's blessing. Not for our own efforts and desires, but for our desire to live lives closely aligned to God's word. We should ask him to get us out of our comfort zones, enlarge our territories, give us a willingness to follow his ways and instructions, even when they conflict with our own ideas. Help us, God, to identify and remove any limitations we have, hindering your way. And as we pray for God's presence, his open hand to be with us, we can remember his promises that he will never leave us nor forsake us. How many times is that in the Bible? I can't remember. But many, many times. So let's ask to protect us and keep us free from sin. Give us that freedom through the cross, but not to sin regardless.
Sin, disobedience will bring harm and it will bring you pain. Maybe physically or mentally, but certainly spiritually. And it can cause much harm to others too. Our prayers for protection from sin are sure to be answered, aren't they? But we've got a part to play to resist and keep a godly mindset. So as Jabez popped up suddenly in the midst of the genealogy of a nation being restored, so let his prayer be our sincere prayer as we move on in our own Christian lives. Because, I'll tell you, such prayers will have God's attention and God's response. Jeremiah 29 and verse 11 says, and you'll know this well, For I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. They are plans for good and not for disaster, to give you a future and a hope. And we have a hope that has gone through the curtain, touching the throne. That's our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Our closing hymn, I think it's quite apt, and this is another of Pamela's favourite ones, so I want this sung at my funeral. It's number 625. 625, when I can find it. Take time to be holy, speak oft with the Lord, abide with him always and feed on his word. And that was her desire, and I pray that's our desire this morning. Thank you.